Yeah, I, mean, I think people don't um, really appreciate the fact that Canada is, um, I think, quite advanced in terms of having a clear regulatory framework. Welcome to Blockchain North, everyone. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Dustin Walper, the CEO of Canadian crypto exchange Newton. Before I begin, if you enjoy these interviews and you want to support us on our mission to inform, educate, and inspire Canadians and others about the blockchain revolution, please give us a like, subscribe to the channel, you know how it works, hit the notification bells as well if you want to make sure you don't miss any of our videos. And stay till the end, because as with all of our interviewees, I will try at least to ask Dustin for some of his predictions for 2024 and beyond. Dustin, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Flo. I'm really happy to be here. Well, uh, likewise, yeah, as I said to you before we began, uh, for me, it's always exciting to speak to a Canadian company, a Canadian exchange. You know, we, we, can, um, we cannot have too many of those, and uh, hopefully they stay in Canada. That's, that's kind of the hope uh, every time. So I thought it would be fitting, given that a lot of people right now are discovering crypto blockchain for the first time, even though for some of us, it feels like it's been around for a long time. Um, if you just give us your definition of blockchain in like a minute or so, and, um, and, and why it's important for Canadians, why they should be excited about blockchain. I think that's a good question. I mean, to me, really what a blockchain is, is simply a distributed ledger. And uh, if you break it down to why that's important, uh, it's that money is freedom. Um, I, did, I, I testified to the House Finance Committee when they were reviewing the uh, Emergencies Act invocation, uh, I can't remember this a while ago. And uh, the point that I made was, if you remove people's access to their money, let's say by freezing bank accounts, seizing assets, these types of things, then really what in effect you're doing is depriving them of freedom because you can't pay your rent, you can't buy gas, you can't buy groceries, you're really not free. And so, uh, you know, I think what has really concerned me over the last, you know, say decade, uh, decade and a half is the centralization of power uh, in the hands of banks. And if they have control over the flow of all money, because cash is really going in a favor, then I think that's a real impediment to freedom. And I think it's, it's potentially, uh, you know, detrimental to, to democracy. So, um, you know, normally uh, money sits in uh, the database of banks, right? And, and they sort of true up on a regular basis to make sure that money's not being created, but we have no way of really auditing that ourselves. You know, you can't go to a bank's Oracle database or whatever they happen to be using and make sure that uh, no money was created that day in their ledger. Whereas with say Bitcoin, anyone can download a node and anyone can actually verify cryptographically that no money has been created outside of obviously block rewards and that the system has uh, integrity and people can look at the open source code and they can verify for themselves that there's no back doors, um, that state actors can't go in and interfere with it. They can't create new money. So the monetary policy is very clear, but fundamentally money is freedom. And I think blockchain and crypto is really about uh, decentralizing that and, and giving some measure of freedom back to people uh, that, that I think banks have been sort of trying to consolidate. Since you mentioned uh, money is freedom and you sort of hinted at, you know, some of the issues uh, with, uh, you know, bank accounts that may in some cases be interfered at and without necessarily naming the elephant in the room here. Is there a particular concern in Canada or said differently, is there a particular um, benefit, potential benefit of blockchain in a country like Canada? I'm also thinking that we're a very large country. We have a disproportionately large bank banking system. Um, yeah, and we're also pretty connected globally. Yeah, I think there are a number of benefits. Obviously, it's a bit different than what you might experience in, say, a developing country where really like the currency itself uh, is maybe being hyperinflated or sort of there's very little trust. I think in general, the Canadian institutions are fairly trustworthy. Uh, so I would never say that like, you know, you can't trust the financial system. I just think we need to have, uh, you know, like a release valve to make sure that uh, there isn't mm -hmm. too much centralization of power. So I don't see it as an all or nothing type of thing. I see it as sort of accretive. Um, you know, a, a couple of examples of where I think there's immediate value. So, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our customers use stable coins, which we can get into, um, often use it to pay contractors internationally or to get paid by their clients that happen to be in different countries around the world. I know in the past, we've had contractors in Argentina, for example, mm -hmm. and because of the, the hyperinflation situation there and because of sort of a distrust of the uh, banking system, which was really quite harsh on... Um, uh, international payments and uh, currency controls. Uh, those people preferred to get Bitcoin as payment and some people prefer stable coins, but the fact is that for them, it was a very important method of you know, sustaining their livelihood. 
uh, in, in an environment where, you know, I can't remember what the peak inflation was in Argentina prior, prior to sort of the recent election, but triple was, digits, was, for sure. Yeah, tri triple digits. And that sort of, it, it becomes life or death. Like, uh, sort of, if your currency is being inflated away and your, your buying power is shrinking rapidly, then, then it's, a big, it's a big deal. Uh, I think one of the big things that's underappreciated is that regardless of what you think of the current sort of implementation of this, it is going to form the backbone of the next version of the financial system. And so it's going to get absorbed into existing financial institutions and it's going to become part of that framework. And so I think unless we really embrace it wholeheartedly in Canada, then the innovation is not going to happen in Canada. And so I think there's mm -hmm. a real policy objective, not only to like, you know, uh, sort of think about the, the trading of different crypto assets, but also thinking about how we make sure that uh, new innovation happens in Canada. This is a framework in place to get it to a certain point where it can take off and that we're competitive globally. I think without that, obviously, you know, we can get, we can get into some sort of macro econ, but, you know, Canada's standard of living has been in decline, which is a problem. I mean, if GDP per capita is shrinking and we're also trying to make it difficult. Productivity as well. Productivity as well. If we're trying to make it difficult for innovators to succeed in Canada, then that's going to continue. So, um, yeah. That last point is is so important to mention indeed uh, that, you know, like blockchain will happen, digitization, AI, uh, perhaps you could say the energy transition, uh, all these things will happen with or without Canada. We're not significant enough uh, an economy and a power uh, to, um, you know, to, to, to believe that, you know, it won't happen without us. So I'm, I'm really glad you, you mentioned that. Now, in the last few months in particular, I'm thinking, you know, since the uh, approval of the ETFs, uh, it's been very clear that, um, you know, the amount of institutional funds, uh, you know, coming like to the crypto space has been significant. There's a lot of analysts out there who look at, you know, the ratio between, you know, how much inflow versus, you know, how much, uh, Bitcoin is actually being produced. Um, and perhaps that can be extrapolated a little bit to a growing interest in crypto, in blockchain, uh, talks about the Ethereum ETFs potentially as well. What do you remain, oh, sorry, what do you believe remain uh, some of the misconceptions about crypto uh, amongst in particular investors, since that doesn't necessarily mean institutional, it could also be retail investors. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest um... I would say misconceptions, and I don't know if this is just purely an investor thing, but I think there's still this sort of perception among some policymakers, especially in Canada, that crypto is really just a, still a flash in the pan thing. It's only for criminal activity. Uh, it's something that North Korea uses to extract money from, you know, you know, ransomware attacks, that sort of thing. And I think obviously in any any new innovation like this or any new sort of system of, of uh, the exchange of value, you're going to get things like that happening. Uh, it's always been true in say cash. Uh, if you look at the, the real estate sector in Canada, there's certainly, uh, you know, money laundering and organized crime that is part of that equation that that's, I think is being looked at. And so uh, I think that's a, a misguided perception or a misperception uh, on what crypto is and what the value of it is. Uh, so how that translates to investors um, is really just thinking about, like, what are the actual applications and how will this become part of the financial system going forward? And I think, um, you know, obviously, you know, for example, we're required to report to FinTrack and take very robust measures against money laundering. Uh, we, have, we have to do know your customer. When, when customers onboard with us, we have to be very certain about who we're doing business with. And the banks heavily scrutinize this. If we're not if we're not doing that properly, and say a payment gets reversed, we could be on the hook for it. So, so the stakes are really high. Uh, so we're, we're going above and beyond to make sure that we're we're you know like not um, being sort of a, you know like a, an enabler of money laundering. Um, and I think that's not really appreciated at the policy level. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. And we're going to talk about policy and regulation in a second. I'll just share a quick thought that I had just a few days ago, maybe a week ago. Uh, I was thinking, you know, people often, um, you know, like people like Peter Schiff, for example, but there are many others, you know, talk about a speculative asset. But people are just, you know, betting on crypto, you know, n number go up and, you know, it will never go down. And, and, and I find that concept of, you know, crypto is just speculation actually quite questionable because crypto and in particular, you know, let's say public ledgers and Bitcoin being the biggest one, um, you know, and the most secure, um, you know, it's it's in, in a way it's everything but speculation because there's so much information, so much data on chain, so much of, of, of crypto. And again, in particular, Bitcoin is actually quite predictable as we're seeing now. Of course, you know, analysts and, you know, predictors aren't always going to be right. But right now, it's just what's happening right now with the price of Bitcoin over the last two months is exactly what was predict predicted by, by, by many, many experts uh, of various stripes. 
And then if you compare that with, for example, real estate, I would argue that it's more speculative because you never know what governments are going to do, in particular in terms of uh, quantitative easing. Um, do you? What do you think of that? Do you, do you think of it the same way that that you know people just don't get it yet that it's it's actually a very unique, very transparent, very very uh, logical kind of asset? Yeah, I think one maybe concrete example is in cross border flows. So historically, if you were sending money, say to someone in Europe. Um, uh, the way that that would work is you would have usually uh, intermediary banks that would have agreements with banks, you know, in, in, in both countries that you're trying to send money to, sometimes multiple intermediaries, depending on what agreements they have with whom. And so your money would get passed along. It could take a week plus to get there. You get fees deducted along the way for different banks that had, a, you know, their hand in the, in the, in the, in the pie. Um, and then it might arrive, um, might get held up uh, arbitrarily, depending on, you know, mm -hmm. if they think it's suspicious or something like that. Uh, and so there was never really a common method of exchange across border. It was really just a series of agreements between banks. Um, and I mean, it sort of worked, but it was really inefficient, especially if you're doing business internationally and trying to move funds around uh, for legitimate reasons, or if you're trying to send money home. Uh, if you're an expat, then you're trying to remit money so back to like the Philippines, as is pretty common in Canada. Um, so having a sort of robust international medium, uh, common medium of exchange, I think is just really valuable in and of itself. Uh, and so I think right there, you have a sort of a counter to the idea that it's purely speculative, like, you know, put money in, price goes up. I think there's a ton of utility. I think that's why there's um, you know, such robust interest. And that's why I think, uh, um, you know, like as we get more institutional money coming into it, it's going to only grow in that role. Uh, and I think it's going to cement its sort of pop not only popularity, but importance. Hmm, absolutely. Uh, let's talk a bit about Newton. Let me give you an opportunity to maybe introduce it. Uh, from my perspective, it's, it's first of all, a Canadian uh, crypto platform or, or exchange or centralized exchange, you could say. Uh, it, is, um, it is regulated. Um, you know, we do have some non-regulated crypto exchanges in Canada. So worth noting, and I'm, I'd imagine that's a point that you put forward um, readily. Um, and, and what you put forward, at least what I see on your website and, and in your various uh, uh, sort of uh, presentations is that, um, you know, it is low cost and it is secure. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the origin story and yeah, what differentiates you in a space that can be busy, notwithstanding some recent consolidation? Yeah, I mean, uh, so we started the company back in 2018 um, and really it kind of started out as a side project. I uh, was really interested in the space. I've been following it for a while. I wanted to sort of build a little platform as a hobby. Uh, I had not really been, um, when I was starting Akira, the previous company that I did, which was a telemedicine company, I hadn't really been in, in sort of the code base and getting my hands dirty. So I thought that was a good opportunity to just sort of build something and have a fun, fun side project. Um, turns out there was a lot of demand for what we were doing. Uh, ended up turning it into a company. I uh, wrote the first 10,000 lines or so of code. Ended up starting out doing all the customer support uh, myself and then build a team around it. But the thing that we really introduced to the Canadian market that was actually unique at the time, and I think people don't, don't remember this, but uh, fees were extremely high uh, for everything uh, when we started out in, in 2018. So getting money in, getting money out, crypto deposits, withdrawals, uh, spreads on trades or trade fees were super high. Uh, it was not very competitive at all. And so we came into the market and said, we're going to really focus on being a low cost uh, provider. And we're going to really focus on driving fees out of the market. So we were the first, or I think one of the first to offer you know, free transfer deposits and, and withdrawals. And, you know, that was sort of unique. We were one of the first, if not the first, to offer like subsidized withdrawals. Uh, people needed to, you know, get, say, crypto assets into their own wallet. Um, and that really resonated with people. So we kind of, you know, especially in the last bull run, we really, really blew up. Um, and then fast forward to today, we have uh, nearly about 700,000 uh, customers across Canada, hmm. uh, growing at a pretty substantial clip. And we've maintained that How, focus. Uh, where, on... where does that rank you, let's say, amongst the top exchanges in Canada? Do you know that? Uh, I don't know exactly. And, 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 you know, there's, there's a big distinction between those are all, uh, you know, customers that we've onboarded organically. There's some other okay. plays where they've sort of, you know, accumulated different platforms and then you have to deduplicate and then, you know, how many of those are active. Um, so, you know, because we started, uh, sort of after the 2017 bull run, but before the 2021 bull run, uh, we didn't have any legacy from that, like some other platforms did. So I don't know exactly. I know in terms of like actual trading volume. Uh, we exceed a lot of other platforms. In fact, most of the other Canadian ones, uh, from what I've seen or what I can guess, uh, on the retail side. So we actually do a lot of trading volume, uh, more than people I think would expect. And part of the reason is that we've really tried to maintain a very easy to use platform and we tried to keep our cost uh, extremely competitive. So if you look at some of the other well-known uh, platforms in Canada, certainly some of the US ones that are playing in Canada, 
some of the other big players that are not just in crypto uh, uniquely, but kind of spread across a couple of different asset classes. We generally have better pricing than, than them uh, by, by significant margin. So how do you make money then? I mean, if you're low cost or I mean, obviously, I, I can imagine how you make money, but how do you stay competitive? Because it is a it is a competitive space. People do have choice. And, uh, you know, each exchange, I feel, has its own unique advantages. Um, but if you're low cost, that that would hint at, you know, lower revenues, too. Well, you know, what's sort of interesting is because we make our revenue on people you know, trading, Primarily, we don't have a bunch of other fees on different things like withdrawals. Um, people actually trade more with us because we've really maintained that focus on mm. you know, keeping our, our spreads uh, you know, reasonable. We've also spent, I mean, you know, I should also say one of the big things that people love about our platform is how easy it is, right? So in terms of like on-ramp, off-ramp, uh, I think, uh, you know, many of our customers feel like, you know, Newton is the best place to go and do that. And we tried to make that process incredibly easy, onboarding, the process of getting money in and out, trying to reduce friction, reduce fees. And so that's been a huge hit and our customers trade a lot more with us. And so despite the fact that we keep our prices you know, sort of lower than some competitors, um, we actually, you know, this quarter will be quite, quite profitable. Uh, and, and we have like a team of, you know, about 50 people at Newton uh, with a real emphasis on engineering and product development and design. And that's what I spend a lot of my time on is how do we make our product continuously better? How do we obsess over, you know, making that process, that journey really nice and easy for customers and then expanding on what we offer. So like, you know, today, I think people perceive us as being primarily an on-ramp, off-ramp, which we're totally happy mm -hmm. to be. I think in the future, uh, we want to expand out to offer, you know, more advanced uh, tools for people that maybe are more active traders or, uh, you know, maybe trading larger volumes uh, or even on sort of the P2P side as well. But um, really focus on product engineering from the fundamentals. And that's what we've done since, since we started the company. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, and I would imagine that working on the product is actually fundamentally important when, again, consumers have quite a bit of choice, um, you know, because, yeah, the, the reducing the friction, I suppose, uh, no one wants, you know, clunky platforms with unclear, you know, information and, and, and yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. So I introduced you earlier as uh, one of the regulated platforms in Canada. So maybe we can talk a little bit about regulation. And uh, the way I see it, it's it's obviously still very early. It's um, it's an evolving process. Uh, a lot of conversations around uh, policy, in particular, happen behind closed doors. So we're not always uh, privy to uh, you know what's coming in terms of regulation. But one thing seems to be clear to most people I speak to is that. Canada's biggest challenge is that regulation happens at the provincial level, um, that we have a sort of a leader of the pack in the Ontario Securities Commission, but then we also have the Alberta and the BC Securities Commission and the Autorité des Marchés Financiers in Quebec, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, what is your view on, you know, regulation in Canada and 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 how it's evolving, basically, and, and what impact that will have on Canadians' ability to not just invest in crypto, but benefit from better financial services yeah I, mean, I think people don't um really appreciate the fact that canada is um i think quite advanced in terms of having a clear regulatory framework i mean obviously you know like uh, i wouldn't necessarily say that i agree with every aspect of, of the way that it's being done but on balance it's pretty straightforward like you know what you have to do and uh it's a very refreshing and very different approach than what we've seen in the us with the sec sort of litigating the rules um which is sort of like you don't know if you're on side until the sec sues you which I think is not desirable. So uh, I think from that perspective, Canada has been actually fairly easy to, to, to deal with. Um, the question is like, you know, are all of the different things being proposed from a regulatory standpoint good? And do they meet the objectives? Um, and the primarily obje the primary objective of um, many of these regulators is you know, protecting investors and their secondary object objectives like, uh, you know, maintaining the, sort of the flow of um, the orderly flow of, of capital through capital markets. Um, so you know, for example, in Canada, we are uh, one of, I think, maybe 12 or 13 uh, registered platforms. Uh, so it's a pretty small list. And that means that we're registered with the Ontario Securities Commission. And we're in the process of uh, moving under CERO, formerly IROC, which uh, has traditionally regulated sort of broker dealers in the security space. And so the way that Canada is treating regulation is very similar, um, very analogous to securities. So uh, if you were a trading platform like a Quest Trade um, uh, versus like a Newton, the frameworks are becoming very similar. Um, now, the, I think there's good aspects and bad aspects. So the good aspects are things that really protect, uh, you know, uh, investors and offer them uh, sort of, uh, you know, like uh, some level of assurance that the, the platform they're dealing with is not uh, fraud, fraudulent or going to scam them or that the people behind it, are, you know, aren't criminals, things like that. 
Uh, so the things that really I think are great are you know, the fact that they require us to use like a, you know, it's called a qualified custodian so that when things are in cold storage, there's a quite a high level of assurance that those assets aren't going to be, uh, you know, like a, a stolen or lost or, or things like that. Uh, there's a lot of requirements around books and records. We have to do financial audits. We, uh, we do things like, um, you know, proof of reserves. Uh, they audit our policies and procedures. Um, they basically uh, allow customers when they have a complaint to go to the same ombudsman that, that you would go to for your bank. Uh, and they, they will sort of adjudicate uh, complaints. Um, so there's a lot of process in place there that I think is, is really uh, quite beneficial, actually. Um, I think where it gets into a little bit of trouble sometimes is on things that um, are more just from a, uh, we need to control this um, uh, aspect that maybe don't actually benefit investors all that much. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the things that, that I think we're really concerned about is the way that the CSA wants to regulate uh, stable coins, which is sort of mm -hmm. its de facto securities. And from my point of view and from the industry's point of view, and, and even from a legal point of view, our view is that uh, stable coins really are not securities and they uh, constitute a method of payment and should be regulated as a form of payments, right? So there's already a framework for that. Uh, there's no reason to treat them like securities. And so that, that type of regulation, I think, is potentially harmful, not only to, um, you know, like individual Canadians that might uh, have that as a source of income, you know, they're accepting USDC, for example, from clients abroad or, or paying contractors, um, but also for the industry, like trying to build out new payment uh, rails or new payment technologies, not being able to deal in those in those stable coins would be a huge blow. So I think there's good and there's bad. And one of the roles that we have to take on is, as, you know, a platform and as an industry is really trying to lobby for, uh, you know, positive change and for frameworks that, you know, obviously protect investors, but allow for innovation to happen. For anyone who's watching us and uh, is new to crypto, um, I'd like to hope that there are some who are going to be watching this video. Um, maybe it's worthwhile for you to explain to us what a stablecoin is and, and why it's so important. It seems almost disproportionately important within the industry vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, other elements. Um, so what's a stablecoin and why is it important? Yeah, stablecoin, quite simply, is a crypto asset that's pegged to the value of, let's say, the US dollar, as in the case of USDC. Certainly, that's the most popular stablecoin, USDC, uh, USDT, which we don't offer. But um, so usually stablecoins tied to the US dollar are the most popular because they allow you to, um, you know, it, it sort of exchange value internationally quickly without uh, you know, intermediaries, but without the risk of exposure to price volatility. So, let's, you know, for example, if you're getting paid in Bitcoin, there's some risk that, you know, the, the value of Bitcoin could be up or down. 5% or more that day, depending on what's happening in the market, which really isn't desirable if your only objective is to get paid and then to convert that into money that you can use for, you know, paying your, your rent or, 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 or your employees or what have you. And so stable coins have, have turned out to be, um, I think one of the, the sort of innovations with the, the most utility, like immediately, um, I think they're taking off there. There's a huge value, a uh, huge interest in them. Uh, what's really cool about them as well is, you know, for example, unlike if you're using a payment platform like a PayPal or a Venmo, where it's sort of a proprietary medium of exchange. Like if you're both on mm -hmm. PayPal, then great. If you're not, then you can't interact really. Um, yeah, you know, stable coins allow for this layer where it's totally peer to peer. Obviously, you know, if you go into the hood, there's things that say circle could control with USDC, they can, they can burn it, that kind of thing. So there's a little control there and there's obviously um, yeah, some regulation uh, that, that's behind that. But in general, you can transact peer to peer, have it pegged to the US dollar, and not worry about um, whether it's going to take a week trying to go through multiple banks uh, to get to another country, or things like that. So incredibly valuable uh, technology. Yeah. Um, similarly, for those who are watching us and uh, who are maybe already convinced uh, or convinced enough, should I say, that, um, you know, this is the future. This is also worthwhile investing in because, you know, it is likely to uh, to 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 gain a lot of value as more use cases are developed as more people adopted people and, and institutions. Um, could you share a few comments on, on an investment strategy? And I'll preface, and you can do that too, that this is not financial advice, but you are in a unique position and people are investing on your platform. So what would be maybe one or two key tips that you would share, um, including perhaps on security, since that is such an important aspect and one that you know raises a lot of concerns still to this date? Yeah, and I'll just, you know, again, preface with the fact that I, I don't usually give investment advice because uh, it just gets me in hot water, um, but I can give some general kind of thoughts on it. Um, you know, I, I don't, it's like, I'm not particularly knowledgeable, for example, on like what's going on with Solana meme coins, so I, would, I wouldn't want to coach somebody on that. Um, but I mean, as a, as a general comment, so maybe we could talk about this sort of the safety or security aspect first. 
So for, okay. the, so for the average person that's not willing to, or not interested in investing the time and the effort into really learning about, you know, self-custody and, you know, how hardware wallets work and, and all of that, which I think, I think is super valuable. And I think if people are interested, they should do that. But I think for the average person that may, maybe isn't interested in that or, or doesn't know where to start, um, the best place to start is really to work with a platform that's, that's regulated. Um, just because like you can have some level of assurance that there are controls that your money is being, you know, like uh, we're sure that it's there. Regulators are looking at it. We're getting audited yeah. by, by third parties, this type of thing. So it's always a good place to start um, your crypto journey. And I think one thing that we've learned, uh, and I think a lot of a lot of individuals have learned, is you just kind of have to be paranoid, especially once you get into the realm of self custody. You know, there's all kinds of ways that you can, you know, trip up on landmines, especially when you're in some of the more exotic uh, parts of the DeFi Web three ecosystem. And so I think really taking the time to understand the technology you're using, what the risks are. Uh, and not rushing in, you know, yellowing on, on say, meme coins without understanding the, the technology uh, is really important. I'll say, generally speaking, uh, as an asset class, you know, like uh, crypto assets, just like pretty much every other asset class, are very sensitive to interest rates. And so, if you sort of look at the macro level, um, you know, this year, I think they're sort of predicting interest rate cuts. I would suspect or would expect that that's going to affect uh, all asset prices, but, you know, crypto assets will certainly be among them. And so, you know, thinking about the macro environment is usually really important. And then obviously, like what we always tell our, our, our customers is like, don't invest more than you can afford to lose. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe start with the things that are well understood before getting into the uh, more obscure corners of, of uh, DeFi. A question I, I've always wanted to ask a, uh, a Canadian, um, you know, crypto exchange uh, leader, founder is, um, you know, I mean, I don't know. Personally, I would feel more comfortable having my uh you know, crypto, should I not cold storage? Should I keep it on a centralized exchange? I would probably feel more comfortable having it on a Canadian platform. I hope I'm not going to make too many enemies amongst the foreign platforms, but just, you know, we're Canadian, we're in Canada. Uh, and of course, the Canadian financial system, you know, is not perfect. It's probably clunky and slow and inefficient. And that's a good reason why, you know, we need crypto solutions, but uh, it is perceived as safe, uh, as well regulated. And so, would you argue, and I mean, you have good reason to want to, that uh, holding your, your crypto funds and frankly, just dealing with a Canadian crypto exchange is safer in Canada or is it more complicated than that? I, I think, I think the, the short answer is yes. Uh, I know I'm going to get some pushback from the not your keys, not your coin uh, crowd, which is fair. But, um, you know, if you just look at sort of, I, I think like, you know, if you're dealing with a platform that is subject to Canadian regulation, uh, it is uh, subject to the process of the courts. And so if something goes wrong, you know, you can be pretty certain that you're not going to be just totally hosed and the platform would fly by night, it disappears tomorrow, you know, rug pull. Uh, and so, for example, like there's, there's things that we're required to do that I think should give people a lot more peace of mind. So, you know, over 80% of our assets have to be held in cold storage. And, and there's a, a very specific set of criteria as to, or criteria rather, as to what cold storage means and who can act as a custodian. Uh, very similar to the way it works in securities. Um, we have to use certain types of hot wallets. Um, like we, we use an NPC hot wallet provider. Fireblocks is, is the name of the provider we use. This is all in our uh, in our OSC uh, decision, by the way. You can go and read this on the OSC website that details how we operate. Uh, we're, we're required to keep all of our customer assets completely segregated from our own assets. Um, so for, you know, if we have crypto, let's say we have Bitcoin of our own as part of our treasury, that has to be totally segregated from customer assets. Same with cash. So if we have cash that we're holding in trust for customers because they left it in their accounts, that is segregated completely from our own cash or operating funds. Uh, and if you look back to what happened with Quadriga back in, uh, I guess, 2017, 2018, they commingled everything and there was no oversight. And that was just a huge risk. Even if they didn't maybe start out with the intent to defraud their customers, that in effect is what happened. So. Uh, that's something that regulators are very concerned about. I would say probably most concerned about. And I think that's that's right. I think that's where there's a lot of opportunity for uh, things to go wrong if you're not careful. And I think having clear rules around that is very important. And then, for example, we have insurance on cold storage. We have a financial institution bond. We have uh, actually two forms of insurance on our hot wallets, uh, coin cover being one of them. Um, and our, our FI bond covers uh, hot wallets as well. Um, and then there's sort of also like a legal process. So we don't own the assets that belong to our customers. So in, in, in the case that, you know, like, heaven forbid uh, something happened to Newton as a company, uh, your assets would still belong to you. And so in a, in a sort of an orderly uh, court process, you would be able to get those back and they wouldn't belong to us to you know, pay shareholders with. 
And so that that's a you know that hasn't been clear in the past, and especially in some other jurisdictions, is not quite as as uh, crispy. Let's say. Yeah, um, I'm thinking so about FTX yeah. right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, the, so regulars, regulation in Canada and, and sort of the way that we have to structure our agreements with customers make that very clear legally. Yeah. Uh, I want to get a little personal with you, uh, Dustin, and and because I, I find you know it's it's obviously still a very intriguing industry. Um, and I'm pretty involved and up close already now, but I imagine again for anyone who isn't, and frankly, everyone might might, might be interested. I mean, what, what's it like to be the CEO of a of a crypto company? Considering, you know, obviously it's uh, it, it's first and foremost a, a tech company. I think you're a tech guy at heart, from what I understand. Um, but you know, you've received a lot of pushback, and probably not just from you know, let's say the authorities or the the or the, the public or the media, but perhaps even from, from family and friends, I, I'd imagine. So could you share a little bit about that journey, what it's what it's been like, what it what it maybe feels like today, given that you're probably feeling more and more vindicated, I would imagine. I'm making assumptions here, so please feel free to edit any of what I just said. Um, yeah. That, I, think it's, I think it's an interesting question. Um, and I think the uh, state of mind of anyone in the industry obviously is uh, sort of dependent on like what's happening more broadly. And so, uh, you know, like you go through highs and lows, and this is, this is true of any entrepreneur uh, starting, a co starting a building a company. Uh, I think one of the best books on the subject is The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Mm. Um, highly recommend it because it gets into the reality of what every startup is really like, especially in the first couple of years and, and how things can, uh, you know, especially last year, you know, you, you saw a lot of uh, platforms, not just in crypto, but like across the board in 2022 and, and into 2023, having to reduce their workforce substantially, you know, Twitter being chief among them, 8,000 uh, employees down to 1,000. Yeah. Um, and, and so we're still seeing, we're still seeing layoffs at, in, in tech broadly. Yes, exactly. Um, and so I think one of the things that is, I think most challenging as a founder, especially in this space is you're going to have some pretty extreme ups and downs. Now, the benefit to that is once you've been through a couple of cycles, I think you get a little bit you know, the edge comes off a little bit. So when things are going well, you're kind of like, okay, this is, this is nice, but I don't need to get euphoric about it. And when things are maybe quieter or, you know, like uh, when FTX uh, was experiencing problems uh, and, and it was just sort of like, a, like, here we go again, like we're just, we're just getting momentum and then this happens. Um, you're a little bit more, I would say, like zen about it, uh, having done it for a while. Um, but some people burn out. I mean, well, I think a lot of our founders in this space burnt out uh, in the last cycle and said, I don't want to do this anymore. And so I think that's always uh, something that, you know, you have to sort of be certain you can handle. Um, in terms of my day-to-day. -day, what, what, uh, what keeps you motivated, actually? Sorry to cut you in. What, what, what um, in those difficult times, what, what, what are you focused on or what are you feeling inside of you that keeps you, you know, strong, basically? You have to focus on the things that you can control. And so for us, uh, for me in particular, that is, you know, what are we building? Uh, I am very much a product CEO. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm not a, not a finance bro. I'm not a, you know, like a, 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 I don't consider myself to be like a, you know, like a, a manager per se. I really focus on product and that's where I get a lot of joy. And so when we're building and when we're really able to like deliver new features and, and build new product and get it to customers and see the reaction and, and, and interact with them, that's when I'm happiest. And so that happens actually regardless of what's, what's happening in sort of the, the broader uh, market. And that's what we really focus on. It's like, what are we building this week? And we try to keep our cycle time as to like weekly increments. So it's really clear, like, okay, I can affect what happens this week. I can't necessarily affect what happens this year uh, if, you know, the market's uncertain, but I can definitely impact what's happening this week. So we really focus on that, like short cycles, constantly getting value at the door, uh, building better and better product and sort of cementing our, uh, you know, like our business that way. And then for me personally, you know, like I, I, one thing I did this year was uh, I built a, a pretty full, full gym in my garage because uh, I always wanted to make it easier to go and like make sure that every day I'm getting a workout in because that really affects your mental state. And, and I think when things are good or bad, like having that sort of consistency gives you something to fall back on. It's like a baseline. Um, I just so bought a hanging. I just bought a hanging bar. You know, one of those you attach to your door frame because apparently it's really good to decompress your spine when you spend so many you know, so many hours, you know, hunched back behind your computer. But um, no, look, thanks for sharing that. That And maybe, I mean, is there like a story that you like to tell or is there a uh, maybe a, an, an event or even an incident, let's say that, that, you know, is something that, you know, had a real impact on your, on your journey, on, uh, on Newton's development, maybe something that, 
made you change your your focus or your or, or make you know some pivotal decision? Uh, a- anything that comes up? Uh, I think th- there's probably a lot of different uh, things that have happened over the last couple of years, especially as we've been through a couple of cycles. It was kind of interesting, like when we first launched the platform um, uh, early on. Uh, the primary form of like KYC we were doing was okay, sign up with uh, your bank account using Plat. And, uh, you know, coming from uh, sort of the healthcare space before then and getting it more into, you know, this really touches on payments and the sort of e-commerce realm. Um, what we immediately uh, started to understand was like, oh, wow, like payments uh, is interesting because the way that the, the, the payment system works is almost all the risk is pushed off onto merchants. <laughs> and so uh, we started out offering pre-authorized payments and then you would sign up using Plaid. And like within a week of us launching, we had a bunch of attempts uh, to sort of defraud us, like out of the gate. Like as soon as we were on the app store, we wow. had basically fraudsters uh, trying to defraud us. Uh, and thankfully, you know, that wasn't a big hit. I think it was like $500 in, in chargebacks or something like that. But very quickly we learned like, okay, we're entering into a space that is by default adversarial. And that just needs to be our mindset. We need to start basically default paranoid because that's payments in general. Um, but then also that's just the crypto space. Like not only do we have to worry about sort of common run of the mill fraud, but you also have to, you know, consider the nation state actors are trying to figure out ways to, to compromise platforms uh, like ours and, and like others in the industry. So that was a really eye opening thing. Um, but I think it, it's sort of, to me, what's so interesting about the crypto space is that a lot of the security stuff happens in the open. So yes, there are, you know, smart contracts that get compromised and there are things that, that go wrong. But it's all in the open for everyone to see and audit and look at the code and see what happened, look at the smart contract solidity. Um, and that's, I think, great for the industry, especially because it's supposed to be decentralized and trustless. Whereas with banks, you don't, when they have a problem or, or something happens, a bunch of accounts get compromised, you almost never hear about it. Um, they you do find out when it's too late. <laughs> yeah, or when it affects you. And then usually, uh, you know, what they try to do is they try to uh, recoup that from merchants if it was invo- if payments were involved, you know. So... Uh, and so they pass a lot of the risk onto merchants who have to have compl- complicated processes for like, you know, preventing chargebacks, for example. So that, that was really eye-opening for me. It's funny, you have a black and white dog behind you and I have a black and white cat behind me. So maybe they're somehow further down the line, for, like cousins, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah, Australian Shepherd, she, she's, uh, she's a bundle of energy. Beautiful, yeah, yeah. Those creatures that keep us uh, also keep us uh, sane, I think, and remind us uh, perhaps um, that there is more than you know what's in the computer. Um, True. I do like to ask all of my guests, um, you know, what their surest predictions are for the future. Now, you have already shared your uh, view that with you know interest rates possibly coming down, that's likely to be supportive of increased crypto prices, broadly speaking, not making specific predictions here. Um, is there anything else that's very sure to you in terms of the evolution of this space, um, whether it be regulatory, whether it be in terms of maybe use cases uh, or adoption? I mean, what, what are you the surest of over, let's say, the next few years? Uh, I think what I'm very certain of is that we've hit a certain critical mass where not only is this not going away, which I think was obvious to everyone in the space, but that it's going to start to bleed into the rest of the financial system finally. And, and I think it was, you know, there was obviously a, a ton of hype that happened early on and happened through different cycles about the uh, applications of sort of crypto and, and, and blockchain. Um, and I think it, it sort of failed to live up to the hype. Uh, but like every time it got a little bit bigger, a little more important, the applications got a little more obvious. And I think what's really interesting now is um, I think with the approval of Bitcoin ETFs, especially in, in Obviously, there's been some in Canada for a while, but uh, in the U.S., that was a big milestone. Institutional money is coming in. There's going to be a lot more vested interest in figuring out, you know, what else can we do adjacent to that? And I think actually some parallel trends in, um, you know, AI and AI agents means that this idea of crypto as like the bedrock of Internet money or like as a sort of medium of Internet money um, is really interesting. And the idea of having um, instantaneous micropayments and being able to have like agents that can pay each other. Um, is really interesting. And so I think there's going to be a confluence of, of uh, uh, tech developments over the next like five, 10 years uh, that really uh, allow this to become the, the way of uh, transacting uh, on the internet, not just for people, but also for, for agents. Hmm. Yeah, that's very exciting then. Yeah, I, uh, look, uh, Dustin, it's been really a pleasure speaking with you. I, I especially appreciated the sort of personal insights, you know, um, and, and what you said about, you know, you built your own gym and, you obviously have a, a lovely dog uh, that's your companion as you're working away and uh, 
and of course, all of the insights you shared as well. But I really appreciated this. I think we could speak for a long time. I can't believe it's already been 40 minutes. Um, where can people find you, by the way? Uh, do you have any specific channels? I mean, obviously, your webs the Newton website, but do you blog? Do you uh, Are you very active on LinkedIn? Where, where do you like to point to people? And we'll put it on screen or, or in the descriptions. Yeah, most slash Twitter. Uh, it's just at Dustin Walper. Uh, and if you want to see where I'm shit posting, that's usually it. Um, and uh, it sort of bleeds over into, you know, talking about Newton and that kind of thing. But I'm pretty active on there. Cool. Well, we'll uh, we'll link there, and I'll go and check the the shit posts as well. It is a, it is a very lively, we could say, town hall. That's for sure. Uh, look, thanks again very much. Uh, thank you to everyone for following along. Um, if you enjoy the interview, you know what to do. Thank you very much in advance. Uh, we're Blockchain North. We're Canada's first blockchain focused media company. So we really appreciate all the support we can get. Uh, this is important. We believe that Canada needs uh, a voice. Needs. Uh, you know, narrative needs a, a very active presence across X and LinkedIn and Instagram and other platforms, uh, you know, for Canadians by Canadians, I'd say. So thank you very much, everyone. If you have questions for me or for Dustin, feel free to put them in the comments wherever you're watching the video. Uh, maybe tag Dustin since you know his handle now. Uh, if you want his attention in particular, uh, you can follow us on pretty much all channels. So I won't name them all. And uh, again, Dustin, it's been a real pleasure. Would love to have you on the show again. Maybe do an update, maybe do a really focused interview um, as there's always things happening in crypto. So I'm sure there'll be some, some reason to do so. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dustin, and have a great rest of your week. Bye Thanks now. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.